Grace to you and peace from God our Father. I always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when I pray for you. Since I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Hope. A feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. We have hope in the gospel. That God came in the flesh, born of a virgin. You will hear more about this later. Lived a sinless life. Was nailed to a cross. Took the world's sin upon himself. Became sin for you and me. Died as a sacrifice to make atonement for us. But our hope doesn't stop there because three days later he rose from the grave alive and took his sacrifice to heaven for his sacrifice paid the price for my sin and your sin. Then he sat down at the right hand of God, the Father, where he waits personally to Greece who have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. This is what I desire. This is my expectation. This is my thrill of hope. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. and Thank you for gathering your people in this house. And thank you for just the joy that you give us in this season, looking forward to celebrating your birth. <coughs> And Father, I just praise you and I honor you. Be in this time, move with power and might, or subtly and quietly. Either way, we give you glory. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
time we'll move into our offering time. So if you'd like to have a seat, um, just reflect a little bit as we get into the mood for our service. Uh, the ushers would come forward as well. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you now in this season of Advent and ask that you would prepare our hearts um, to set aside the busyness and to be able to just have time that we reflect on you and what it meant for you to come to us on earth. Um, you're still at work today. What you did thousands of years ago is still relevant and it's still here and you're still moving um, in new ways. So help us to just be ready in this period of waiting, this expectation, this thrill of hope that you brought to earth to know that the hope was not just for people then, but it's for us now today too, that we can still have hope and see you moving in this place. Um, just ask that our hearts would be ready for this message today and that your spirit would be upon Jim as he delivers it as well. We ask those things in your son Jesus.
message that we're about to receive. I just ask that your word would go forth with power. Truth would be proclaimed. Speak to the gem, Lord. You be honored, glorified, and no one will leave her unchanged. In Jesus' name. Children are dismissed from Children's Church. What are you wishing for this Christmas season? It probably goes beyond your Amazon wish list. But what you'd like to see under the tree, your deepest wishes often have to do with regrets, failures, betrayal, broken relationships. But wishing comes with a sense of uncertainty. With all of the evil and the turmoil in the world today, everything feels uncertain. We hope for something new, something to fix the mess all around us. But instead, things just get messy. Hope the fur makes the heart sick. And hope for many has been the fur for a long time. This is nothing new. It was into this same kind of hopeless climate that God sent hope into a broken world. People had abandoned the hope they once held, giving way to the hurt and pain and madness all around them. But true hope came in the form of a baby, born in the the thrill of hope is that Jesus brought hope into a world that was hopeless. He came to rescue us all. This is what makes Christmas worth celebrating. Our Savior and King, Jesus Christ, has come. <laughs> True hope came in the form of a baby, born in a man. The thrill of hope is that Jesus brought hope into the world that was hopeless. He came to rescue us all. That's what the video is. There is an important distinction that has to be made when it comes to hope in general and hope that is specific to God. Because this hope is all about prophecy. It is a message that was foretold and it was what was taking place. Mary and Joseph were invited to live into that prophecy. According to Dr. Brent Kipfer, today about 500 million global followers of Jesus face major restrictions. That's more than one-fifth of today's global church. So just take the people in here, if you're a family of five, at least one of you represents those in the global church that face major restrictions. He also says that over 200 million followers of Jesus face severe persecution, public beatings, humiliations, imprisonments, and even executions. 200 million. Why do they do it? Why do they do it? How do they do it? It's because they live with the thrill of hope. Hope that comes from heaven in the form of this baby because they have experienced God as Father. They've experienced Jesus Christ, the Son. And they have experienced the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. Those who are in desperate situations seem to understand better the work of the Holy Spirit. They've experienced the hope of heaven that has touched earth. This hope came from heaven, and they lived with the certainty of hope that was delivered that first Christmas night through the birth of Jesus Christ. So as Pastor Kent pointed out last Sunday, by the time this story began to unfold, Israel had 400 years of silence from God. And yet there were devout believers who were looking forward to this promised Messiah. The nation's future was on the line. And the obvious question is, do we really know that hope? Do we know the thrill of that hope? That hope in Jesus is what causes people to let God speak into their lives and completely change their trajectory, their plans, their expectations, their lives. So today we're going to look at Mary and Joseph. One carried and delivered heaven's gift of hope to this world. 
and the other protected that hope and the one who carried it. So I'd like to ask you to start first. I know this seems like tackling quite a bit of scripture, but I'd like to ask you first to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. If you want to stick your finger in that or, or know that later we will go to the Gospel of Matthew. But first we're going to look at Mary. We're going to look at Mary for a very specific piece, a, a specific reason as it relates to hope. Now much is made of Mary's age, and we'll get to that in just a second. But I'd like to read beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. Nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Her age matters. But the truth is, we don't know exactly how old she was. She was old enough to understand how conception happened and old enough to travel to the hill country where Elizabeth and Zachariah lived. While certainly still in, in her youth, she was likely around 14 to 15 years old. That's the young lady that received this visit. That's the young lady who had an encounter with the angel Gabriel. Now, according to Fawcett's Bible Dictionary, Gabriel means hero of God. How would you like your name to be? Hero of God, right? Gabriel, hero of God. As the archangel Michael represents the angels in their might in conflict with evil, so the archangel Gabriel in ministering comfort and sympathy to mankind in dark times. If you want to get a visit from an angel of God in dark times, you want this hero of God. So Gabriel explains to Daniel, for instance, the appalling prophecy of the vision in Dan that Daniel had in Daniel 8. And then he cheers Daniel up with the prophecy of the advent of the Messiah. This is going to happen. In the New Testament, Gabriel delivered the good news to Zechariah about the birth of John, as well as the birth of the Messiah himself to the Virgin. There is, in Gabriel's manifestations, direct quote, there is in Gabriel's manifestations the simplicity and absence of terror. An absence of terror corresponding to his character as a comforter. This is the character of this angel who stands in the presence of God and is sent on this assignment to Mary. Mary heard a specific message from Gabriel. Here's your assignment. You are to carry the hope of the world. Simple assignment. You are to carry the hope of the world. Mary was told by the angel Gabriel that she was going to have a baby, that she would become pregnant because the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her. Israel's hope, the long-awaited Savior, was going to be carried by her in her womb. The hope of the nation for her, but the hope of the world for God, would come from heaven to earth through her. She would literally carry literally carry the hope of the world. And in time, she would deliver the hope of the world. 
Then God confirmed what she heard from the angel Gabriel through Elizabeth, as Kent taught last week. And you have to hear this from Mary's perspective. As he said, Ms. advanced in years, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, she wasn't old, she was just advanced in years. Ms. advanced in years, Elizabeth couldn't contain herself because she was filled with what? The Holy Spirit. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth confirmed that Mary was carrying my Lord. She doesn't say that Mary, you are carrying the Lord, right? She makes a declaration, you are carrying my Lord. With that confirmation, Mary broke into song with my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Way too often, we distance ourselves just enough to talk about the Lord as if he's not our Lord. My soul has to magnify the Lord. My spirit at some time, at some point in life, my spirit needs to rejoice in God, my Savior. Not just the Savior. Mary's call was not to a short-term nine-month mission trip. Mary's call was to a lifetime of caring, delivering, nursing, raising, and then releasing God's hope for the world. And in more figurative and yet just as real ways, such is God's call on all believers. It begins to make more sense that Jesus said in Matthew 5.14 to his disciples, Few are the light of the world. Make hope your mission. Be bearers of that hope. Carry the hope of Jesus into places of hopelessness. Deliver the hope of Jesus to people that thought God forgot them. We are surrounded by people who believe that God forgot them. Some here in this room. Nurse the hope of Jesus where people seem unprepared to receive some of the heavy stuff. Raise the hope of Jesus where people are afraid to believe it. And then release the hope of Jesus over and into those who are open and ready. Release the hope of Jesus. I'd like to invite you now to turn to Matthew chapter 1. Mary carried and delivered that hope. But in Matthew 1, we're going to see how Joseph protected the hope of the world. I'm going to begin by reading verse 18. Before I get to that, young Joseph's assignment was different than Mary's in this. He was to protect that hope. Joseph was likely in his late teens, and his plans were beginning to take shape. The most prominent was, was beginning the rest of his life with the love of his life, Mary. And even at a young age, Joseph showed tremendous character in his concern for her. Even though he misread what to him seemed obvious at first, it seems as though Joseph was one of those guys who could sleep. Regardless of the anxieties of his day, Joseph could sleep. And when he slept, he dreamed God dreamed. Anybody here have trouble sleeping? Like, not this guy. Like, when you read his story, you realize this guy can sleep. He's the one that, that, like, he just lived through the worst day of his life, and he went to bed and slept. Some of us envy him. It was in his dreams that an angel of the Lord spoke to him with specific messages related to his assignment. Son, you're supposed to protect the hope of the world. And you're supposed to protect the one that carries that hope. And to do that, you're going to have to be vigilant, you're going to have to be mobile, you're going to have to be flexible, and you're going to have to be adaptive. All of these are revealed in these dreams. Dream number one, to protect God's hope for the world, stay vigilant. You cannot fear the repercussions of man when you're carrying out God's plan. Take Mary home as your wife. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had, betroth had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found 
to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, meaning that he was merciful and willing to put and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Very few will believe this truth. But Joseph, you need to know that what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She is carrying the hope of the earth, and his name is Jesus. You cannot fear the repercussions of man if you are going to follow God's plan. Joseph, all of your life you have been hearing about this plan of God, the prophecy of this Savior who, who will save people from their sins, You've grown up listening as people have read the prophet Isaiah when he wrote, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Mary is this virgin. She is pure as the driven snow, unworthy of divorce. She is unworthy of divorce. And she is treasured, treasured by Almighty God. You've been hearing about this plan? This is the plan. The child she is carrying is this promised hope. You've heard about this. This unborn child, Jesus, this hope is on assignment from heaven. This is not an earth conjured up hope. This is hope from heaven. This child is God with us, Emmanuel. Protect that hope, Joseph. And it begins with you honoring Mary and taking her home with you. Do not hang your head. You put your arm around that young lady, and you take her home. And you make sure that not only she knows she's treasured, but anyone who sees the two of you walking down the street will know that you feel treasured because you get to walk with her. Dream number two. The lesson in dream number two is to protect God's hope for the world to stay mobile. Do not linger where you are. Matthew 2, 13 to 15. Now when they had departed, speaking of the wise men, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise. Again, in a dream, right? This guy can sleep through anything. <laughs> Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Rise, take the child. Go to Egypt. Just remain there until I tell you. If we believe in principalities and powers and, and you know, if, if we believe in what Paul teaches in Ephesians 6, right? where there are cosmic forces, principalities, powers. If we really believe that in different locations, can you imagine the trembling that was happening by the principalities and powers of darkness in Egypt when he crossed that border? Because this child crossed the border into a territory called Egypt and remained for a period of time. Your assignment is to not only protect the child, but to protect his mother. Protect those who are carrying this hope. Provide her with cover. And he rose, and he did it. Dream number three, to protect God's hope for the world, stay flexible. Joseph is told in Matthew 2, 19 to 21, not to stay in Egypt. 
You were there for a time, but I didn't send you there to, to live there forever. When Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother. Go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he learned that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. He went and lived in a city called Nazareth that was spoken by the prophets that, some, that this might be fulfilled, fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. For Israel, Egypt had been this place of contradiction. At one point, it was the place Joseph landed. He didn't go by choice, but it was where he landed. And it would later be used by God to feed and shelter Jacob's family. Then it became a place in time that moved from privilege, where they had land carved out for them. It moved from that place of privilege to a land of slavery until the time of Moses. When God declared to Pharaoh, it was time to let my people go. When the time of Babylonian captivity took place, the prophet Jeremiah had a word to those who, who escaped to Egypt, and it wasn't congratulations. And now God sends Joseph, Mary, and Jesus to Egypt, but only for a time, not for long. He's trying to tell them that while while you are here for a time, this is not your home. God says, go back to the land of Israel. Those who were a threat to this child of hope are now dead. This is no place for you to raise this child. It may have provided some safety, but just because you've got some safety there, this is no place to raise a child. Not my child. This was always intended to be temporary, yet God saw it coming even back when Hosea wrote the words out of Egypt, I called my son. When God calls his shot, it is a matter of time until it all comes into focus. Skeptics had to be reading the Old Testament prophets and saying somebody's got to be wrong. Isaiah can't be right if Hosea is right. But God. But God. Fourth dream comes from Matthew 2, 22 and 23. I've already read that those verses. And it teaches us to protect God's hope for the world. You have to stay adapted. Do not take this child of hope into a place of unnecessary risk and danger. Sometimes I get the impression that we think that the greater danger that we can enter either into ourselves or put other people into, we think we've just really proved our faith, right? Don't go there. Yes, go back home, but not to your hometown. Take this child of hope to the safety of an unlikely place for Roy. All right, just think with you for a minute. Everybody's got their own hometown, right? You did not, many of us did not grow up here. The town that I grew up in, I was with a, a group the other day, guys that I graduated with in 1977. Yes, we had school in 1977. <laughs> there were about eight or nine of us that were sitting around talking about our experience, and all of us began to reminisce like we would do, right? But we started to reminisce about the schools and that, that we competed against, and there was one school that when I said the name of that school, everybody went, why? They were the school that everybody wanted to fight for, got into a fight with. They were the school that when you drove down in, you felt like you were driving down into a dark place. Go to that town, that place. Royalty doesn't come from there. And yes, once again, God saw this coming, as Matthew 2, 23 points out, through the prophets of old. Being called a Nazarene was a degrading insult. It was something like their own N-word. <coughs> Nothing but degrading. There was no value in being called a Nazarene. This is what Jesus would later be called. Degraded as many of the prophets of old prophesied that he would be. When you read back through the Old Testament prophecies, you will see that they make the declaration, this king, this Messiah will be degraded. Isn't it good to know that God is not limited by the degrading insults of others? This is my life. These are the insults that have been spoken over me. But I serve a God who 
who says, I can redeem. I have redeemed, and you are not that in trouble. Right. Right. God's hope for the world, Jesus Christ, was not defined by the insinuation of the Nazarene insult. Instead, Jesus Christ redeemed the degradation and turned that title into a mantle of honor. If Jesus is a Nazarene, then I too am a Nazarene, and I wear it with humble distinction. Where do we go with this? We've got Mary, who carried the hope of the world. We've got Joseph, who protected the hope of the world. Where do we go from here? For both Mary and Joseph, they heard from angels, messengers of God, this is your assignment. They each had their own assignment, but they needed each other to accomplish their call, the collective assignment. Mary alone, no. Joseph, you're part of this too. The two of you work together to carry out the assignment. They were not lone rangers. They were co-rangers, living under the authority of God to accomplish the will of God in carrying and protecting this child. This child, the hope of the world in the person of Jesus Christ. This child, Emmanuel, God with us. Most of the time, what I see and hear is people say, Lord, give me the life I long to live, and I'll do amazing things for you. But when God spoke to Mary through the angel Gabriel, her response was, I heard what you had to say. I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Joseph's response was similar. He didn't have much to say, but he went to bed with his plan, and he woke up and did God's plan. He went to bed planning a divorce and woke up as a committed husband. He went to bed with fresh memories of the wise men who came from the east to celebrate his child, and he woke up in the middle of the night and hurried mama and baby Jesus to the safety of Egypt, a land he did not know. He went to sleep in Egypt, planning a life in this foreign land, and he woke up and took his young family back to the familiar land of Israel. Joseph went to sleep unsettled and fearful of the new Herod, who was likely just as evil as his father, King Herod. And he woke up to his family. He woke up and took his family to the safety of Nazareth. In both cases, Mary and Joseph did not ask God to bless their lives for the sake of the kingdom. They gave God their lives to use as he saw fit for the sake of bringing hope to a world that didn't have it. I mean, I'm gonna, I, I need to just say this again because we need to grasp this. Mary and Joseph did not ask God bless my life for the sake of your kingdom. They gave God their lives to use up as he saw fit for the sake of bringing hope to a world that didn't have it. God, I've got these tremendous plans. If you just bless me, God, I'll do great things for you. Got a couple of kids who are saying, you want me to do what? How is that supposed to happen? Cool, I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. I want to live. I want to have more in common with the 500 million and the 200 million. I want to have more in common with Mary and Joseph. I want to stop asking God to watch what I can do for him and experience more deeply what it means to hear from God what he has destined for me. To say, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said, and then rise from my sleep and do it. Oh, God, speak. Send your messengers, the ones that come straight from your throne, and I will listen. I'd like to ask the day strangers to go ahead and come on back up, get ready to play. Sometimes I think people wonder, and a few of you have asked me, what would make this day a success? Like, for a pastor, what makes a day a success? I'll answer that today. What would make this day a su success is this. If just one more person here caught the difference between saying, bless me in what I want to do, 
and I am your servant, may it be to me as you have said. If one person here hears that, and it alters your life, that will make today a success. Along with the follow-up, where you wake up, and you rise up, and you do it. I want to invite you to take time with God, beginning as the day stringers play several songs about this gift of hope. I want you to listen to see if Emmanuel, the thrill of hope that comes straight from heaven, does he have a word for you? And I'm going to also ask that if you just want someone to pray over you today, I'm just going to ask Marissa and Cindy Miller and Aaron and Ted. If you guys would just go back, it just seemed fitting. I looked around this morning, I was praying about this. I looked around and I thought, you know what, we got a counter next to the kitchen, there's a serving table. If you want to be served by having someone pray over you today, feel free to get up while they're their play. Go to one of these four and allow them to pray over you. We can talk about the hopelessness that we see in this dark world. But if we're really going to be honest and candid, I've had more conversations with more people, even in the last three days, here in our family, in our culture, that need to experience hope. Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. What he promised will be. If you want to be prayed over, join them.
going to let ministry time continue in the back. Uh, there are microphones. If you'd like to share a reflection or something about the message this morning.